obesity is one symptom of unhealthy skeletal muscle. There's a plethora of things that happen, but at the core of all of these issues or many of these issues like Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, they don't begin with body fat. They begin with unhealthy skeletal muscle as a primary defect. And listen, we know that high intensity interval training improves insulin sensitivity, improves glucose regulation, improves lipid profiles. Obviously, you have to do it over time, but it, it seems to have instantaneous effects, certainly from an insulin sensitivity glucose perspective that is just highly, val it's just so valuable and it doesn't take much time. It's much easier to maintain than it is to improve. Okay. I am very happy and uh, excited to talk to my good friend, Dr. Gabrielle uh, Lyon here, and she has been uh, just killing it lately on, I've seen you just been training like a maniac lately. What's up with that? You're on a mission, it seems like. The training? Working yeah, out, you yeah. mean? I've seen you on your social media, just killing it in the gym, getting after it. I mean, I, I've been thinking a lot about this. You cannot be healthy. There's no way for an individual to be healthy without healthy muscle. You cannot be healthy without it. So I might as well try to get as much as I possibly can. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a body part. I mean, obviously, as you know, it's the largest organ in the body, as you're very you know. fond of saying. <laughs> and, and I guess I want to just because behind you, you have your new book, Forever Strong, which is a great book. I had a copy and uh, of it and I've looked, you know, I've read through it. It's wonderful, wonderful. So how did I know it's been a hasn't it been a bestseller and stuff like that? It's been doing well for you, right? Uh, yeah. So this book outsold Arnold Schwarzenegger and Atomic Habits its first week, hit the New York Times list, hit every other list. And it's done pretty well. And, and I think that the reason is because people are ready for the message. Just like when you wrote your book, people were ready to hear a different narrative, a, a different way of thinking about something. And that's- Yeah, well, I guess, I, I, I guess, well. yeah, I guess it's good to talk about what that message is because, you know, you've, as you've pointed out many times, and I, I certainly concur, we've been focusing on losing weight and being thin forever. And that is part of the battle, but it's, it's missing a big point. Maybe you can, what are we missing out on? And what's the new message? Well, the current framework for thinking about stuff, and it's funny, I'm talking to you, you and I've known each other for years. We are good friends. We've had many conversations. And the people that are listening to this podcast are obviously people that are very interested in what you have to say and what you have been saying. So they're going to be open-minded. And I would say over the last 50 years, we've been focused on this obesity epidemic. In fact, when I did my fellowship in geriatrics and nutritional sciences, a portion of that was obesity medicine. We literally call it obesity medicine as if it is a entity within its, in and of itself, that obesity is for some, it would be like called hypertensive medicine. Obesity is one symptom of unhealthy skeletal muscle. And this begins, there's a plethora of things that happen, but at the core of all of these issues or many of these issues like Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, they don't begin with body fat. They begin with unhealthy skeletal muscle as a primary defect. And you know, Sean, one of the other things that I was thinking about, I'd love your perspective on this, if in fact obesity, being overweight and obese was the driver of all of these things, of uh, these diseases of, of chronic, you know, chronic illnesses, then why is it that if 70% of adults are either overweight or obese, why is it that only 30% have diabetes? So if it was causative, one in a hundred percent? Well, obviously I think everything's multifactorial, but I mean, you know, I, I think even among the obese populations, when we look at like all cause mortality and longevity, some of them live longer than others, clearly. And it seems to be the ones that have more muscle mass are the ones that are protected from some of these other issues. And so, I mean, I'm, you know, I, you know, I'm by BMI, I'm obese right now. I mean, my BMI right now is like 32 or 33. I'm, you know, but obviously I carry a lot of muscle on me. So, I mean, most people wouldn't look at me and say, look at that fat guy. So, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, obviously there's sarcopenic obesity, which is, I think is just the absolute, you know, as far as body composition is the absolute disaster of anything. You know, you can be thin, you can be overweight, but if you're under muscled and overweight, it's gosh, it, it's just a disaster. I've taken, I remember taking care of patients like that with broken bones. And not only is the surgery technically hard because you're dealing with all that excess, you know, body fat, you have to technically deal with it as a surgeon, but 
they couldn't heal anything. They were just in, in miserable condition. So I do think that muscle, as you know, I mean, muscle centric, you know, we talk about obesity medicine. We don't really talk about muscle medicine. You do. I mean, you t- you've been talking about that for as long as I've known you. You had this muscle centric <laughs> approach. And I've in practicality focused on that my whole life because I think it's so important. Uh, from a functional standpoint, but what is it? We say it's important. What, why is it important? I mean, maybe you can go into some of the specifics. Why is it important to have a, you know, decent amount of you know, functional lean mass? What's the, what's the advantage? Yeah. Well, the, the first thing that we all think about, arguably so, when it comes to skeletal muscle is exactly what you're doing. You're throwing around kettlebells or you're you know, rowing and you're just out there crushing it. And That is one aspect of this organ system, this skeletal muscle organ system, which is critical. Mobility, strength, power, being able to produce force. These things are required for living an independent life, period, end of story. There is also an underappreciated role of skeletal muscle, and that is really its metabolic component and arguably even this immune system interface, which we can chat about. The metabolic component, which really isn't a surprise to many people is this idea that skeletal muscle is the site of glucose disposal. So it's the site of 80, upwards of 85, if not more percent of glucose disposal. Of course, it varies depending on the size of the person, the health of that skeletal muscle tissue, but in, but glucose disposal, the carbohydrates that you're eating or not eating, if you're on the carnivore diet, will be disposed of in skeletal muscle. The question is, why is that important? Well, do we require glucose? We do. Can we make it? We do. So we don't have to ingest it. But the reality is, if you are ingesting foods that have carbohydrates, you will increase blood glucose. You know, and we're not talking about gluconeogenesis, et cetera, but we're talking about the ingestion of carbohydrates. Those carbohydrates must be disposed of. High levels of glucose, that is toxic to the body over a period of time. The definition of that is diabetes if blood sugar remains elevated. Healthy skeletal muscle is the primary site for disposal, number one. Number two, it's also the a primary site for fatty acid oxidation, for you know mitochondrial health. Just the mass amount of mitochondria exists in skeletal muscle. It's also the amino acid reservoir, as you pointed out. When an individual falls or has an injury, an orthopedic injury, skeletal muscle a potentially will protect them. But B, from this highly catabolic state where an individual is going through many metabolic demands, skeletal muscle serves as the best uh, reservoir for amino acids that we have. And that becomes important for survivability. How are we going to survive? The other important and interesting aspect of skeletal muscle, I mean, there's many different aspects, but contracting skeletal muscle releases these myokines. And these myokines, things like interleukin-6, interleukin-10, things that are often released from cells of the immune system, like macrophages, that when they are released from macrophages have an inflammatory effect, when contracting skeletal muscle releases these myokines, and there's hundreds, they have a profound effect on the body, meaning, again, there's hundreds. They can dampen a overactive immune system. They can help with substrate metabolism. They can direct lipolysis. They can direct glucose utilization, all kinds of things. They can direct neuronal function differently. We've all heard about BDNF, but it's not that BDNF in the bloodstream, it's the exercise then releases, that causes the release of other myokines, which then eventually stimulate BDNF in the brain, all kinds of things. Yeah. And, and obviously those are all, uh, you know, happening behind the scenes. You know, most, most, most of us are not paying attention to our mitochondria. We can't, but we're, what we care about is like, for instance, longevity. I mean, there's a number of studies, at least there's a strength correlation to it. And of course, strength is more or less directly uh, correlated to how much lean mass you have, particularly if it's, uh, you know, functional lean mass. And so what about, what are the practical, like, can I avoid cancer if I have more muscle? Can I avoid heart disease if I have more muscle? What does the data show? The day, you, you know, you bring up a really good point, and I do think that we should touch upon it because I think that we're at the precipice of something different. A lot of the literature has done a disservice between muscle mass and strength. There's a lot of literature, you know, the, the three decades of sarcopenic literature really diverge strength and mass. 
you will hear people say that it's just the strength that matters and that the actual amount of muscle mass doesn't matter. And one reason why this has been kind of considered a standard or a, you know, a, a truth, which is, it's not actually true, is that we often measure body composition through DEXA. And I think that you and I have talked about this before, but DEXA is really looking at bone and fat and then extrapolating lean mass and only a portion of lean mass is skeletal muscle. It's not directly measuring skeletal muscle. And if you look at the data, if there's a loss of five to 8% per decade of muscle mass loss as individuals age, then one has to recognize that in order to find a detectable change, you have to lose about 10%. There has to be a 10% change in skeletal muscle mass for these things to become detectable over time. And why am I saying that? Because I believe that mass and strength are very closely connected. And we're going to see more of this because they're using a new method of measuring. And that's called a D3 creatine. So it's a deuterated creatine. 98% of the body's creatine exists in skeletal muscle. Yes, are, are there... Is there creatine in, in different portions of the body, like the brain, et cetera, but not nearly as much as in skeletal muscle. And by using a labeled creatine, they, the individuals, the scientists, the research scientists will be able to look at and are looking at, this is validated, skeletal muscle mass directly. So now we are going to begin to look at skeletal muscle mass directly. And when you look at skeletal muscle mass directly, you will see that strength and mass are highly correlated. And it's actually the loss of skeletal muscle mass versus the gain in body fat that is more important for outcomes that we care about, like the things that you mentioned, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and these kinds of things. Yeah, what did, let me, because obviously... W- we both recognize, and I think many people are starting to recognize it, that lean mass is important. I mean, and it's obvious for function. You know, if I want to be able to carry my suitcases to the airport when I'm 70, I better be pretty strong when I'm 50 and so on and so forth. What, you know, as far as do we know, well, I guess we could talk about how do we maintain it? I mean, because obviously the, what's the recipe? I mean, what's the recipe here? Because, you know, like how do we, have, I mean, you know, yeah. work out. Eat, I, mean, I mean, I would love to hear your specific? perspective. I, I've been thinking a lot about this. It's much easier to maintain than it is to improve. I mean, someone like you could get away with, again, it is probably based on volume and uh, previous training, but you could easily get away with two days a week of, of some kind of training. You're probably going to maintain your skeletal muscle mass. So when we talk about maintenance, I, I think the goal is how can you put on and be as strong as possible? So when there comes a point in time where you are going to have some decline, because it, it does happen, you know, are there these changes that have to occur in skeletal muscle. I'm not sure that they have to, but I do think at a certain point in time, you know, we might see changes in satellite cells. We might see changes in in insulin resistance, things that maybe we take for granted in healthy muscle. But the reality is, I, I do believe that we will see changes in strength and the way in which we are going to maintain healthy skeletal muscle is build as much as possible. And then focus on maintaining. And I'm curious as to what your thoughts are as it relates to that as well. Well, I mean, obviously I do it because I must think there's some advantage there because I'm trying my darndest to stay, stay strong. And, and fortunately, I've been able to do that. At 57, I'm literally stronger at 57 than I was at 47, which I think is pretty cool. And I think part of that is diet. I mean, high quality, I eat tons of high quality protein, as you know. One of the things we often hear is, you know, these pro bodybuilders die early and You know, you don't see a lot of big, strong people walking around at 80. I think we're, I think that's changing though, in my view, because I'm starting to see people that have, because this is really the first time in history where people have had the, really, I'll call it a luxury to be able to train, you know, with with strength training into their later years. In in years past, that this wasn't done. It was exercise, you know, for women, you know, not even 75 years ago was considered weird. And, and men didn't really engage in because it was kind of the underclass that would do that. And so we've only now sort of elevated. And so we're, I think we're just now getting into the age of people that have trained their whole lives living a long time. And so you're seeing guys like Schwarzenegger, Stallone, and they're in their 70s, and they're still very more functional than what I would think of what my grandparents were like, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, whenever they were that age, you know, 30, or 40 years ago. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, my just 
when I see somebody old and frail, that didn't happen overnight, right? And it, it, it and, you know, and you, you, I mean, occasionally you'll see an obese person that lives in a, a long time. Most of those guys die of cardiomyopathy, metabolic disease, or cancer. You know, 60, 70. and then the ones that make it to eighty and ninety, as they start to fade away, they almost unequivocally all get frail, and their function slows down. And once they start slowing down, their walking speed slows down. There, you know, it's not a long way before they fall, break a hip, or die, or something like that. So I think. My guess is that the longer you can maintain a high level of muscular function, the longer you're going to probably live. Again, it's speculative at this point, but I just it just makes sense to me. I don't know. Are we seeing? I mean, are we seeing? Do you have any data on older people that are maintaining mass and how they're doing? So uh, there's going to be two points to this comment. Number one, the baseline models that we're looking at in the literature when an individual is sedentary is a diseased model period, end of story. If it is a, quote, healthy older adult and the exercise component is not included or discussed, then that is a, a, sed a sedentary individual is an unhealthy individual. There's the active state and the, you know, a neutral, a non-movement state that is not a, that's not a neutral type existence. That's unhealthy. What we do see in the data is number one is never too late. It is never too late to put on muscle mass and or strength. And we see that in 80 year olds. And they do a lot. Again, I'm a geriatrician by training. There is a lot of data surrounding improvements that can happen, albeit it's much slower. And that could be for a number of reasons. Slower to put on muscle mass is again, number one, for there to be a enough muscle to be detectable changes, right? It's a slow process, especially as an individual has aged. The other flip side to that is it didn't happen overnight. The frail individuals that you are seeing, part of it is because they haven't kept up with their training. Maybe they never trained aggressively. Maybe their weak link is they have back pain or knee pain or hip pain or things that, or tendinopathies or things that really limited their capacity to do cross training and functional training. But yeah, it is never too late. The speed at which loss and gain happens, I think is questionable. Again, because we have not been measuring it directly. It is all based on DEXA data for the most part. And DEXA data is not a good measurement. What is the, because you keep hearing after age 30, you start seeing decline in muscle mass. What is the current belief on that? I, I know you can mitigate that. I, I believe I'm, you know, I'm doing what I can to do that. But the typical person, what are they going to see on, on, on loss of muscle and strength as time goes by? I think the first thing that they're going to start to see is they're going to start to see it in their blood work. Right. And what do I mean by that? You're going to start to see increase in levels of insulin, increase in levels of glucose, increase in triglycerides, things that would uh, relate to metabolic dysfunction or metabolic syndrome, increase in visceral fat. Those are the first things that you're going to see. And then so you'll see changes in blood work and then you'll see changes in body composition. And that potentially could be a decrease in skeletal muscle mass, uh, increase in body fat. You might even see changes in hormones. You know, it's interesting. Men do not have to have a decline in testosterone. Women will all decline in hormones. It's just the way that we are made. I think that it is a uh, design flaw. But men, you can, you know, I measured my dad's testosterone at, you know, in his 70s and his testosterone was close to 800. An individual who is training, who is sleeping right, who is eating well, their hormonal status does not need to change. Sex hormone binding globulin might go up, but the rest doesn't necessarily need to change. So when we talk about this magic number of 30, I believe that that is in part a diseased model that individuals hit 30, decide they don't need to train as hard as they used to. And then that's why we're seeing it. And maybe again, because 30, you would, you know, you really think that growth is over the idea of, of growing up anyway, is over. So there might be some change in insulin, et cetera, but I really think that it's an environmental problem and not necessarily, it's an environmental problem, which leads to sedentary behavior, which then leads to a diseased model of muscle. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally on board with you with that. I think the, the, the expected decline that we hear about muscle mass, strength, testosterone decline, which is cl clear, clearly happening in the population, is probably avoidable. And again, I think you are looking at a disease model. And the fact that I think I saw somewhere that like after the age of 30, 
a shockingly low minority of the population can even do like 10 push-ups and a shockingly no, small minority, even sprints, even can run a sprint anymore because, you know, they just can't do it. I mean, they're just literally so incapacitated by that age. Are you seeing that as well? Yeah, I was looking at um, some of the CDC data and the most recent data that I looked at, 50% of Americans don't exercise. 50%. And those... So 50% don't exercise. And I think it's something like 73% don't meet the recommended combined cardiovascular activity and uh, resistance training. So we have a sedentary population that, you know, there is this idea of, of sprinting is going to be so foreign. I mean, we have an overall sedentary population. Do you know that those recommendations for activity, I, they haven't changed in decades this 150 minutes, this is the baseline. This has not changed in decades. And we're not even meeting that. 50% of people are not meeting that. That's insanity. Yeah, I'm definitely, <laughs> I agree with that. It's amazing to think that, uh, you know, after, you know, like, like I said, and we're seeing it even in younger and younger folks, it, like I always laugh, like I'll go to the store and I just see everybody around me and everybody's sick. And I'm like, gosh, if the zombie apocalypse co comes, <laughs> You guys are all getting eaten. You know, they, they are getting eaten. And think about it this way. So let's say someone is meeting 150 minutes. That's nothing. A hundred, so if someone is, is actually, it's, it's kind of like the protein recommendations, the minimum to prevent deficiencies. This is kind of like the minimum to prevent, you know, physical insufficiency. The standards are extraordinarily low for physical activity. And then, you know, yeah. So. I just think that we have to recognize that these recommendations haven't changed. 50% of people are not doing it. And that even let's say someone is clocking the time and saying, okay, I'm going to do 150 minutes. How many times do we even see that be effective right there? Again, I don't believe that there are physical non-responders. I, I do believe that there is a an input and an adaptation that has to happen. There has to be a skeletal muscle adaptation we are, I would say, arguably, we're not working hard enough. We are just going in and doing the same slow, I mean, obviously not you, but cardiovascular activity and looking for some outcome. But the reality is, if someone is putting in those 150 minutes and doing some kind of steady state, yes, that's better than nothing, but that's just getting by. That's just, that's getting by. That's not improving things. What do we know, you know, with 50% of the people doing nothing, I mean, so to be in the half, in the top half, all you got to do is any exercise, basically. Exactly. So you're already there. But where do you need to be like to get these? I mean, you obviously don't need to be a world champion athlete to get the benefits. I mean, in, in, in some regards, that may even be kind of, kind of productive in some ways. But where do we need to be? Do we need to be like r relative to our age cohort? Where should we, you know, should we be in the top quartile? Do we know where those numbers start to, you know, there's a point where it's where there's diminishing returns and there's a point where it's super important. I, I like to get people that are sedentary not to be sedentary. I think that's a huge step. Yeah. But beyond that, where do we need to be? Or do we know? I think that this is a really good question. And I would say that I don't have a great answer for you because training history, injury history, all of these things are extremely individualistic. But you know, I think that people should be in the top quartile. I don't know what, what you think, but we should shoot for the moon and see where we land. And it really comes down to, you know, there is a lot of discussion about that lifting weights over 60 minutes shortens longevity, et cetera, et cetera. These are all epidemiology studies. We know that lean, that muscle mass and lean mass, they're not the same. So skeletal muscle and lean mass are not the same, but we do know that the benefits of having skeletal muscle clearly outweigh we know that that improves survivability, period, end of story. Does an individual need to be the top 1% of VO2 max? Do they need to be in this top 1% of strength? Probably not. But I think if we shoot for the, the top quartile, that would be great. I'm I mean, curious I mean, as to what your thoughts are If you are shoot for the top 1%, there's not going to be many, a lot of people that are going to make that because that's pretty, that gets pretty hard. Right. But I mean, but I mean, again, when, when half your population is doing no exercise, it's not that hard to get in the top quartile. I got to do is do. I agree as much exercise as half the people that actually do it. So it's not all that hard. Let's talk about, because pro, I mean, protein is always, a t you know, you and I have always been fans of protein consumption. What's, what are the latest numbers on protein? Because I know I, I sent you a study that was kind of a little bit, changed things about dosing and, and the fact that you could perhaps have a larger bolus as opposed to the distributed stuff that, that is often talked about. But let's talk about the basic recommendations on protein. We know 0 0.8, the RDA is a joke. I mean, we know that's just ridiculous, yeah. but what does the current sort of level understanding indicate? 
the data really supports, you know, you're looking at 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kg. That's where the, the data, you could confidently say you would find a large amount of literature to support that amount of protein. I see no problem going to one gram per pound ideal body weight. I think that that would be more ideal. Again, this th there's no downside to that. The current amount of protein consumed by a female is around, I think it's around 60 grams of protein, and it's around 100 grams of protein per for a male. And that is that that's too low to support metabolic health. Where the future of dietary protein is going is once we get this meal distribution uh, conversation out of the way, which seems to be picking up a lot of steam lately, it really is going to come down to thinking about the essential amino acids and more the limiting amino acids. So methionine, leucine, and lysine, which is where I think that the direction is going. And I believe that they're going to start a scoring system. So there's something called the EAA9 that is you know, we have diaz and, and PDCAS and then the indicator amino acid, you know, metric, et cetera, et cetera, which nobody really uses. You don't pick up the back of a, a protein bar and say, okay, well, this has a, a diaz score of X. But the EAA9, I believe, is what they're going to try to institute. Well, it will give a protein score to really kind of clear up the confusion. And the scare, the score might be zero to 100. Something that is a high quality protein will clearly get a higher score. But that's really the direction is going to be the, ultimately it's going to be an EAA3. And that is where the future, I think, of protein research is going. When you and say this, EAA3, is that yeah, it's three, three EAA3. specific amino acids, I yeah, would assume? for those three yeah. specific amino acids. That's, yeah. that's where it's going to be going. Um, and, you know, this idea of, the anabolic response, this distribution, I, I would just like to mention that protein distribution, if you're young, it doesn't really matter. If you're a young male, protein distribution doesn't matter. If you are an older adult, if you are an, uh, an individual who is fighting a chronic condition, there, I think that the evidence still remains that meal distribution matters to someone who is not in, in perfect health. If someone is obese, if someone is, you know, looking for weight management, uh, if someone is again, sarcopenic, then one meal a day, I don't think is advantageous. Let me just delve a little more into these essential amino acids and, and limiting amino acids, because I think it's an important mm -hmm. concept. If I'm building a structure, let's say I want to build an, an insulin molecule, which you know has a bunch of amino acids, and I don't have enough, I have enough of everything. I have all the methionine and valine and tryptophan, but I don't have enough lysine. I can build exactly zero molecules of that Correct. insulin. So you have Correct. to have that. And that's one of the things I think people don't realize is if you don't have everything, it's like building a car and, and you say, well, I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't have a steering wheel. Well, guess what? You can't build a car, right? You got to have all the parts in the right ratios. And if you don't have them, you get to build zero of those protein molecules, which is, you know, I, I think something a lot of people don't get. Cause when we talk about protein quality and EA, EEA, nine or i'm a huge animal protein you are uh, proponent oh my, are you serious <laughs> believe it or not but i mean where do where do we i mean like obviously lysine leucine some of these these critically harder to get ones which so where are we going to get where are we going to find those those being animal-based proteins yeah. i mean the, the animal-based proteins are the highest quality proteins again what you said it's about the essential amino acids and it's about the limiting amino acid and each amino acid is limiting you know, in different amounts for different things. For example, you might see a, you might see leucine as a limiting amino acid. And that is an essential amino acid that you have to get from food. It comes from high quality proteins. It comes from whey. It comes from red meat. It comes from fish. It comes from, you know, eggs, et cetera. But as we age, for example, the requirement for leucine may go up and making sure that you are getting leucine in an appropriate dose is going to be valuable versus lysine and leucine is a meal specific amino acid. And I know that there is this conversation about anabolic threshold, which we can certainly come back to because of this new paper that came out of uh, Van Loon's lab. But leucine is important for muscle health and it, it would be a limiting amino acid for muscle protein synthesis if someone was not consuming the appropriate amount of dietary protein at one time versus 
again, so leucine would be considered a meal to meal amount versus something like lysine. Lysine might be a limiting amino acid, but the pool of lysine might exist. It's not a meal specific amino acid. The pool of lysine might last much longer than the increase in leucine at a, a meal. So they're not all they're not all the same. They all do different things. They all have different physiological functions. For example, tryptophan for serotonin production, threonine for mucin production, you know, et cetera. Let me talk about, because there's a faction of the science world that, that really is into protein restriction even still. And they're saying that, you know, too much leucine is going to stimulate mTOR, uh, you know, and, and lead to decreases in longevity, perhaps increased rates of cancer. How do we reconcile the need to have muscle and have enough leucine and still, you know, get around what they're talking about? What are your thoughts on that? Well, my first question is, are we still there? Is this really well, still there? Yeah, there, there are still people out there, you know, Walter Longo and those guys are still out there, you know, t doing their still. protein limited fasting, mimicking diets for longevity. And there's, there's still quite a few people out there that are proponents of relatively low protein diets. That's really unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Again, you guys, Sean and I have been friends for years. So it, it is quite unfortunate that even is a, a conversation. So this idea that protein restriction versus overall calorie restriction, cyclical calorie restriction seems to help in longevity is not a overarching wide view of what it takes to live a long, healthy, functional life which I'm sure that you've talked about many times in this podcast, mTOR, which is a mechanistic target of rapamycin, is in all cells in the brain, in the pancreas, and muscle. And it's stimulated in different tissues differently. Skeletal muscle, is it, it's exquisitely this mechanistic target of rapamycin. mTOR is exquisitely sensitive to leucine. The branched chain amino acids, somewhat less, but really the driver of muscle protein synthesis is must be stimulated by leucine. This is critical for muscle health. In the pancreas or the liver, mTOR may be stimulated by insulin or excess carbohydrates, excess energy source. By the way, food is not the only driver of mTOR. mTOR is a growth promoter. And the idea that we should further restrict dietary protein to improve longevity makes no sense because if you believe that skeletal muscle is your organ of longevity and what is necessary for survivability and metabolic function, metabolic health, then as we age, it becomes much more difficult to maintain the health of skeletal muscle. The only way you're going to do that is through training and dietary protein to further restrict and Walter Longo. So the, the current RDA is 0.8 grams per kg that they've determined to be the minimum to prevent a deficiency. While a protein deficiency doesn't happen in the immediate, the idea that you would further restrict it, and I believe that he recommends 0.3 grams per kg. So now you have a group of people that are recommending something below the minimum to prevent a deficiency in order to uh, focus on longevity. I think uh, it, that just doesn't make sense. And there's no data to support that. Yeah, I didn't know it was as low as 0.3. That's amazingly low. What about, so let me ask you the, on the other side of the coin, because like I, I've talked, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with Jose Antonio down in Florida, and he's done research yeah. on high protein diets and athletes. And I yeah. asked him about, is there a downside to too much protein in, in the sedentary individual? And his response was, I don't care about sedentary people. So what he told me, because he says, you know, we, no one needs to be sedentary. But is there, you know, if we're eating, because I mean, I, there's days I'll eat 500 grams of protein. I mean, it's a lot of protein. That's two per pound in some cases, because I just mm -hmm. pound a lot of protein. I haven't noted that my kidneys are fine. My liver's fine. Is there a danger in any any population, I mean, outside of some weird like, you know, PKU people or something yeah. like that, where protein's going to be, higher protein's going to be either, I mean, I can see where it's, it's overkill and you don't need it, but is it going to be directly harmful in any way? No, we, we haven't seen data that supports that. And I like Jose Antonio's response is that, okay, so he doesn't care about sedentary individuals. I don't think, you know, back to this driver of mTOR mTOR is driven by many, many different things. And by the way, do you know, as you get older, mTOR is actually ramped up in the body. It might be blunted in skeletal muscle, but overall, mTOR baseline seems to be a bit higher. And this is out of Blake Rathmason, 
they are down in, I think they just moved to UTMB. But baseline mTOR is somewhat already stimulated, but in skeletal muscle, it's a blunted response. And so this kind of goes to the question, if you are sedentary and you're over consuming, it's really a calorie issue. So let's say someone is already have, they already have too many calories and they already have too many carbs. So the average American is eating 300 grams of carbohydrates. And then you add protein on top of that, that would not be a good idea. And it wouldn't be necessarily a good idea um, because you're going to, again, further cause dysfunction. Are you going to cause metabolic dysfunction if you're adding more protein? That's difficult to do, right? Uh, it's usually fats and carbohydrates, but I certainly wouldn't add in additional calories in above someone who is already consuming a highly processed diet or over consuming calories. I think that's a bad idea. There, you know, we talk about the strength versus, you know, volume, muscle mass versus strength. And there's different mm -hmm. ways to support them. I mean, essentially you got to do some sort of resistance training, you know, mm -hmm. and then you can pick high reps, high volume, things like that. Are there any particular, I mean, my, my take of the literature is generally, if you want to get stronger, you're going to lift a little bit heavier. And generally, if you want to put on size, it's going to be tend to be a bit uh, better with a volume response. Is that kind of what you read of the literature is volume equals size and heavyweight equals strength? Is that still a general dichotomy? I, yes, I would say. I mean, that that is somewhat of a dichotomy and there is a continuum. There's a wonderful paper by Brad Schoenfeld and it, it talked about this strength continuum. I think Alan Argon was also listed on that paper and it's this strength continuum. So yes. And I think ultimately volume is really important and there are different metabolic adaptations, whether you are lifting heavier or lighter, whether you are doing steady state cardio versus high intensity high intensity interval training, all of these things have different metabolic and physiological adaptations that, you know, a well-rounded program is going to be really, really important. And I also think that we're going to start to see more of a blending the more we begin to measure skeletal muscle mass directly. And I'm not just talking about biopsies, but really as we begin to use this doubly labeled creatine, this tagged creatine, I think we're going to see changes that it's not going to be as black and white. So you're going to see strength, hypertrophy. I think it's going to be much more of a continuum than a do this and do that. Yeah, you mentioned sort of combination training. And I certainly, you know, I do some sprinting. I do some hypertrophy work. I do some strength work. I do some, I try to do some explosive jumping and those types of things just because I think those are all important for me to do that. What, I mean, if you could prioritize, let's say somebody has a time limited, like they've only got, you know, I mean, obviously we, many people don't train at all, but let's say somebody's got, I don't know, 20 minutes a day, where would you prioritize? What would be the first thing you'd focus on? And, you know, if you could rank order these things. You know, it would probably depend on the age. That's very interesting. It depend on the age and if they have any kind of metabolic conditions. I think being explosive and I think maintaining power and doing some kind of high intensity interval training with weights would be ideal. Again, that could be swinging kettlebells or doing a bunch of Turkish get-ups or doing a row sequence where you're really pushing that heart rate. That might not be for everybody, but I would love to see that. So if I only have 20 minutes, that's how I'm training. But again, it depends on where a person is. But if you only have 20 minutes, you're not doing lifts that are going to take a really long time. You're not doing slow, steady state. You're doing things that require an intense and focused output. And listen, what, we know that high intensity interval training improves insulin sensitivity, improves glucose regulation, improves lipid profiles. Obviously you have to do it over time, but it, it seems to have instantaneous effects, certainly from a insulin sensitivity glucose perspective that is just highly, val it's just so valuable and it doesn't take much time. Yeah, that's that. I was going to ask you the metabolic adaptations because we do know that like a, a, a bout of intense training will make you insulin sensitive for maybe up to 48 hours after subsequent yes. to that training yep. session. So it's, you know, there's obviously room for both. And if you're, say you're diabetic and you want to dispose of glucose, I mean, then we know mm -hmm. that something maybe more moderate in intensity will help you help your muscles to draw in that glucose in a non-insulin dependent way because our, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but our muscles have these you know, transporters that don't require insulin. You know, we can just right. suck in insulin without sucking glucose without even using insulin in many yes. ways. So that's, you know, another. and absolutely. And you mentioned something else interesting is there is this infiltration. There's like this athlete's triad. So there's intramuscular lipids, there's mm -hmm. intramuscular triglycerides, there's all kinds of uh, energy sources within, within muscle. 
Um, some are good, some are not good. There's a decrease in flux. So when someone is sedentary, there is a decrease in flux. There, meaning you're not using muscle glycogen, you're not using these fatty acid byproducts. And when you train and when you do these bouts of exercise, you know, if you think about a marbled steak, you can begin to use these intramile cellular lipids. And again, it's a very complex topic, but to just kind of make a, a simplified overview of it, if you have been sedentary for long periods of time, you can think that muscle becomes marbled and that marbling, you actually can decrease that marbling through bouts of exercise uh, and you begin to utilize it pretty quickly, surprisingly. Uh, but you do have to spend some time training over you know, uh, over a period of time to begin to utilize these energy sources. Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, cause some people, you know, like say the, the triglyceride, intramuscular triglycerides mm -hmm. actually can be very adaptive and, and mm -hmm. they can, you know, like, you know, cause we see, well, as you know, there's people that choose a high carb fueling route and there's other people that are more sort of, you know, they're sort of ketogenic fat based and they have probably different, you know, energy sources within their muscles, intramuscular fats versus not. And, in some cases, it's a problem. Like you said, if you got fatty muscle, like a marbled steak, that's a problem. But some athletes have this, you know, fat in there that they use, they utilize it. So it's not, it doesn't confer the same uh, level of uh, negativity that uh, other things would do. Insulin um, resistance. Yeah. I mean, so that's yeah, one the of the, sure, it's what sure. they thought was one of the original causes. So Brett Goodpasture, have you ever read any of his papers? They're phenomenal. I don't, I'm, I'm, I don't recall the name, but I might. Oh, I don't know. Just phenomenal. And he really talks a lot about skeletal muscle insulin resistance and the substrates within skeletal muscle. And again, you, what you're mentioning is this athlete's, the athlete's paradox, which is this higher levels of intramuscular triglycerides utilized as energy sources, but there's always a flux. So it's not that it is just stagnant and, and staying there. And then there's, whether it's ceramides or diacylglycerol, there's all these other things that happen to an individual who has fat infiltrate within skeletal muscle, but the athlete's system of utilization of substrates is, is different and effective, which is amazing and can be trained. Once you have fat in the muscle, it doesn't mean if you are a sedentary person with insulin resistance, exercise is going to be your biggest influence if you are getting in there and really contracting and training that tissue it is going to be wildly helpful. We go back to the nutritional side of things. A, a few years ago, I, I interviewed Stu Phil. You know, I've talked to Don and Stu, and I've talked to Alan Oregon and Brad Schoenfeld. I've talked to all these guys. And I remember talking to Stu about three or four years ago about, they said there's fat, dietary fat has a role in muscle synthesis. And, you know, there's some studies that are correlative around cholesterol intake and, and muscle synthesis. Oh, do we have a better understanding how fat has a role in, in, in our muscle development do we know if they're because obviously there are essential fatty acids for yeah. clearly and then they probably play a role in the cell membranes of course but do we have any kind of better handle on do because you can't live without fat if you go below 20 right. percent of your calories from fat you get into real trouble not that you have to eat a ketogenic diet but the fat has a role there do we yes. have a clear picture on how fat affects muscle yet i don't know if you know it's definitely coming more to light and it's exactly what you're saying this essential fatty acids and, and typically the omega-3 fatty acids we're seeing that it, it plays an influence in ribosomes and protein regulation in that way not through what we would think about muscle protein synthesis like mTOR so the pathways seem to be different the other thing is it seems to be again this is not my area of expertise, so I'm going off just what I have read recently. There seems to be a different influence for women, that women may seem to have a, that they might get more impact with omega-3 fatty acids in skeletal muscle through whatever the process is on these ribosomes versus men. And I thought that was quite fascinating because there's not much that we know about that is definitive male versus female muscle tissue because skeletal muscle tissue is skeletal muscle tissue. But I do believe that we are going to begin to see ways to continue to fine tune diet and training based on sex-based differences. I, I do think that we are going to begin to see this. You know, I did a, a very interesting interview with um, a woman named Emily Lance, and she is actually in Galveston. And she focuses on, she came out of, of Doug Patton Jones's lab, and she's been looking a lot at sleep restriction, muscle protein synthesis, and then the variation between men and women 
and amounts of protein and muscle protein synthesis and recovery. And so some of her work should be coming out this year. And I, I think that we're going to see differences in recovery and stimulation. Yeah, I well, I did my surgical training in Galveston. I didn't realize they had a big pro, I didn't know they had a big protein research uh, center the there. Big, yeah, yeah, I didn't. That's I didn't where know Bob I, Wolf came out of, and Don trained. That's where all those it, guys trained. Got it. Okay, well, I spent five years in Galveston learning how to be a surgeon. That because I wanted, yeah, I did want to get your intake on women versus men, and there does seem to be. I mean, muscle is muscle, and we know that. Correct. I think per cross sectional unit of area, women women's muscle muscular strength is the same as men. You mm-hmm. know, from my understanding. So, you know, and, and women tend to dominate lower body. They tend to have, you know, they tend to have less upper body muscle mass compared to men, for sure. What do you find that, I mean, obviously women, like you mentioned earlier in the talk, women are going to deal at some point with perimenopause. And how does that change? Does that change significantly the recommendations in any way? I mean, or are there cyclic, you know, a lot of women, you know, well, most women have a menstrual cycle they're dealing with. Are there any sort of changes around those issues? I think that there, I think you could ask a a handful of physicians in the room and they would give you a handful of different answers. I can tell you in my practice and um, during my time as someone who is marginally athletic, I never change my training based on my cycles. I think that, you know, I just don't think that the data is there yet. And again, from, you know, I've been seeing patients for a very long time and we don't uh, train, we don't change their training or their nutrition based on their cycles. But maybe research over a period of time will build a body of literature that proves that to be, you know, that I'm perhaps giving wrong information. But the practicality of it is very difficult. So what happens if a woman is going to a sporting event, but it's the first day of her period, what is she going to do? Right? Are you going to drastically change, you know, your training versus cycles? I just don't think that there's a lot of realism in that from my perspective. But again, I'm not dealing with professional athletes. So perhaps professional athletes are are doing it differently. The other aspect is menopause. Around perimenopause and menopause, I measure women's testosterone and hormones and sex hormone binding globulin. All of these things seem to change around perimenopause and menopause. This has what I believe. So the literature wouldn't support this. The literature would say It doesn't necessarily matter because, you know, we worked on some of these earlier weight loss studies. So if you're just talking about weight loss and body fat recomposition, again, I worked on some of these earlier studies at the University of Illinois. And just by controlling diet and exercise, individuals, postmenopausal women were able to lose weight. There was no difference. But I would say in clinical practice, I see a drastic change in body composition when hormones fall off, decrease in estrogen. And maybe it's a change in sleep. We know that one night of sleep restriction could affect muscle protein synthesis by 18%. That's one night. And again, as progesterone changes, women seem to get changes in sleep, sleep apnea, et cetera. Hot flashes, the whole nine yards. The other thing is that what I found is that, again, their testosterone will decrease, can decrease. Um, It seems to happen. It definitely seems to affect body composition for some women. And then the decrease in estrogen potentially causes women to decrease spontaneous activity. So there's a whole handful of things that can happen, doesn't always happen. And I will say in clinical practice, there's really two ways that we see it. Individuals that don't want to go on hormonal replacement therapy, will they get good results? They do get good results. If they are training hard and they are nailed in on lifestyle. And I will also mention that women seem to have gone through this phase of eating a lot of salad and focusing on more of this plant-based kind of behaviors. At least that's what I see that come through the practice. And as your total caloric intake goes down, the quality of the food and the quality of where the protein comes from in this population, I think, really benefit from this nutrient-dense animal-based foods. Because again, we're talking about zinc, we're talking about B12, we're talking about creatine, which can be very good for women, you know, and men, and is certainly in an aging population, that we just have to rethink some of our nutritional strategies that maybe a nutritional strategy that worked when an individual was in her 30s might not be optimal perimenopausal and postmenopausal. Hopefully that answered your question. I, I have been thinking about this quite a lot. And then On the flip side, when we see hormone replacement, you know, the Women's Health Initiative completely ruined hormone replacement for 
20 plus years, nobody even thought to reevaluate that literature, which is interesting because think about the Women's Health Initiative, you think about prostate cancer and testosterone, all of these things that we take as facts really, I, I think, have a, a profoundly negative impact on people. When we initiate hormone replacement therapy, women do feel better. If their testosterone is very low, if their progesterone is low, if their estrogen is low, women do better. Is it a magic cure for body composition? No, you still have to eat and train. Let me, because, uh, you know, you're a, a very you know strong person, but you're not a big person. You're small. I mean, I'm, so How not, small not, not, are we know. talking, Sean? It's, well, it's not, funny when it, we stand next to each other. It is hysterical. Yeah, I mean, you're. I mean, obviously, but you're. You know, by most people's standards, no one would look at you and say this is a a big person. You're relatively, I guess, we call it petite, but very muscular. How much like are you eating? Because somebody for framework, and I don't know if you want to share how much you weigh, but sure. I mean, let people know what it takes from a, like how much you know whatever protein yeah. sources you're consuming. Yeah. So what Sean is referring to is I'm five one, maybe 110 pounds. Like I'd be pushing 110 pounds. I'm a very small human. And I would say that I have a extremely flexible metabolism, right? I could, you know, I have two very little children. I have a not quite three and a not quite five year old. And my, so my breakfast was, I had, and you know, this was not ideal. We've, we're filming, we're doing all kinds of things. I had a large whey protein bar. So this, I don't even remember the company. It, it had 400 calories and it had 30 grams or more of protein, like 15 grams of fat. And I don't know, maybe it had 20 grams of carbohydrates or something like that. But it was a whey based peanut. I know you're probably cringing. I'm just being honest. Protein bar. Again, I have two very little children. Got to get them out of the door. My husband was on call last night. So I'll have a robust first meal. And then, you know, that might be four to 500 calories. I probably, depending on if I'm super busy, will cycle the calories. I might intake 1500 calories. I might take in closer to 2000, depending on the day and the activity. I hit about 120 grams of protein a day. And keep in mind, I'm a very small person. So you're, how much do you weigh? To how much do you weigh? Uh, right, I'm about 265, 270 right now. So I'm okay. more than twice you. <laughs> <laughs> and you can eat upwards of 500 grams of protein. I'm probably around 120. Uh, 120 grams of protein. My carbohydrate intake is probably close to that. You know, I don't eat a ton of vegetables. I do eat a lot of fruit. Do I worry about fructose? I don't because again, you know, I check my labs and I do pretty okay. But, but keep in mind, the majority of my life, I have eaten probably, and I've tracked this, 130 grams of protein mm -hmm. daily. The majority of that has been lean red meats, whey proteins, eggs, pretty much my whole life. And I sit around maybe 10% body fat. Yeah, you're very lean. Yeah, I've seen you. I've seen you, you know, many times in person. So, yeah. And I can't that, believe it's already been five years. I'm just, I just come shocked that it's already been five years since you've had your first one. So, <laughs> oh my gosh. It seems like it's, it seems like it hasn't been long. So, <laughs> um, I, I swear, I think it, every time I'm pregnant, I'm on a stage with Dr. Sean Baker, hilarious, <laughs> just very pregnant sitting next to you. And I just, uh, but that's it. I'm done. The two babies. I'm good, but you're good. Um, All right. Well, the name of the book is Forever Strong. We unfortunately are running out of time here. Show the book off again. Where's, where can people get that thing? If they want to look at um, it anywhere, Amazon, anywhere. you can get it at Amazon it. and get it at Barnes and Noble. By the way, this book was dedicated to Don, Don Lehman. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's awesome. So if you guys are interested in a world-class protein researcher, Dr. Donald Lehman is, he's kind of yeah, like the, I, I, a, a I grandfather. Like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> would I like cringe to hear me say that. Well, awesome, Gabriel. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me.